You're listening to According to God's Word, a program in which we encourage looking to the Bible alone for God's specific communication to mankind, for what He says about Himself, for what He says about us, what He expects of us, and most importantly, what He has done for us that we might spend eternity with Him. My out-of-studio co-host on today's program is Greg Durrell. Greg is pastor of Heritage Bible Church of Gretna, Louisiana, a co-founder of Reaching Catholics for Christ, and host of the daily radio program, As It Is Written. Greg, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We're in the epistle, Paul's epistle to the Galatians, and we're in chapter 2, and we're going to start right away with verse 19. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto Christ. Verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Greg, if I had to pick a handful of verses, and I just love God's word. But if I had to pick a handful of verses, this one would be right right up there. Verse 20. There's no question. He, he says, I am crucified with Christ. And when you really start looking at the language here, he, he says, I am crucified. Crucified there is perfect tense. And what he's saying is, I have been crucified and will continue to be crucified forever. So again, we see the picture or the point that Paul is making, that salvation justification is an eternal thing. It's a one-time thing. It's on the basis or because of Christ, like you read in verse 19. For I, through the law, am dead to the law. How can that be? Because of Christ. So he says, I'm crucified with Christ, but nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Mm -hmm. Now that's a reality that every believer needs to understand, that Christ dwells within. You don't have to go somewhere and participate in some ritual to receive Christ. You don't have to go to some building to be close to him. He lives within you. So the focal point of the believer's worship is internal. That's what separates true biblical Christianity from all other forms of religious effort. The focal point of a Roman Catholic's worship is external. Big difference between true biblical Christianity, and what is simply a system of religious effort. Mm -hmm. And Greg, you wouldn't say that uh, therefore we, in terms of our worship and all that, we look within, though. No, well, not not in the sense of a New Age concept, but what I'm saying is, is that if Christ dwells in me, where do I have to go to be in communion with him? Nowhere. Where do I have to go to be in fellowship with him? Nowhere. I'm in fellowship with him as often as I want to be, because he lives within me. Paul says in Romans 8, if I have not the Spirit of Christ in me, I am none of his. So it's not something that I get on a Sunday, and then it's gone at some point after, and then I have to go back and get it again and again and again. If he lives in me, if he is dwelling in me, if if I am the tabernacle of the Lord then why would I be trying to set up some system in which to keep putting him in me right. when he lives in me? Again, the Bible points to these spiritual truths, and religious people oftentimes confuse those things with physical things. You've talked so often about John chapter 6. He'll say, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Is he talking about literal, physical things? No, he's talking about spiritual truth, just like he's doing here. Christ lives in me. He doesn't live in me physically but he lives in me spiritually all the time. Right. And I I particularly like, again, the beginning of verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. That is there as well for us to understand our identification with him. You know, Greg, when I became a believer, I understood the gospel, I received it, but somehow I didn't really grasp all that Christ has done. And it's going to take more than a lifetime, maybe an eternity, to really grasp what Christ has done, how profound it is. At the same time, very simple. But my understanding of being crucified with him, what does that mean? It means that 
He is our substitute. He was the only one to pay the penalty for our sins. Yet his death is my death. He did it. Right. But in and my... his righteousness is your righteousness. Exactly. Exactly. And then it gets better. As we started reading, I was thinking, well, maybe some of our listeners, we start out, I'm crucified with Christ. Whoa, that doesn't sound like a good deal. Wait a minute. Let me keep reading. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And you know, Tom, what happens if you don't really understand that? I'll tell you what happens. A lady wrote to me. She lives down the bayou a few miles. And she wrote to me and she said, because of her sin, Mm -hmm. and she understands that she thinks thoughts that are incorrect. She does things uh, overtly that are not Mm Christ-like. So what she does is she puts a few rocks in her shoes every day, one or two stones in her shoes, and she walks to work, keeps them on all day, and her feet actually bleed. Mm -hmm. She suffers. And what she's doing is she's trying to pay for, make atonement for her sinful life. Right. Other people in South Louisiana, for example, coming up as a kid, I can remember numerous times if you were really bad, you had to kneel on rice facing a picture or a statue of the Virgin Mary and say the rosary while you were kneeling on rice. Now, why were you doing that? You were doing that to pay for your sinfulness. Well, wait a minute. If I am crucified with Christ, then the sin debt's paid. Right. If Christ was declared not guilty, then I'm declared not guilty. If Christ is righteous, then I'm righteous, because I've been given the righteousness of God through Christ. If we don't understand verse 20, if we don't understand our position in Christ, then we are prone to work our way and to re- remain in some form of religious bondage forever. Exactly. And let me keep going with that verse. And the life which I now live... In the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Look how much is in this verse. Sure. We're talking about a free gift here. We're talking about God's love to us. We're talking about now living the life, as you've been mentioning, based on faith. Well, what is this faith? The faith has content. It has to do with Christ did and what he did completely. As you said, Greg, if we understand that, We're going to be spared from thinking that there's something in addition that we need to do, that we have to do. Surely. That's why in last week's program, we were talking, we had a question with regard to abstaining from meat during Lent on Fridays or fasting on Ash Wednesday. And and now go through lots of laws. There are 1,750 or more laws in the Code of Canon Law. Not everyone deals with every individual, but there, there are enough laws there, and they carry some weight with them. They carry eternal damnation if you don't live according to those laws, the laws of the Roman Catholic Church. Where is grace in that? That's right. We pick up with verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Well, that's a marvelous verse because, again, Paul builds on things. He's taking the reality of verse 20, where at the very end of that, as you pointed out, he says that we live it. He says, which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Note he doesn't say, and is giving himself for me. Mm -hmm. He gave himself for me, finished product. Christ was crucified one time. I have been crucified with Christ. Sin debt is settled justification is mine because of my faith in Christ. Now I have to live by that faith. Faith must have an object. What is the object of my faith? If it's Christ, then I'll have a triumphant life. If it's my sin, if it's my circumstances, then I'll have a problem. So Paul says, if you understand verse 20, then do not frustrate the grace of God. Don't set it aside and pick up some religious mantle and begin to try to work your way again. That was the problem that the churches at Galatia had. Mm -hmm. They were setting aside the sufficiency of Christ, the finished product, and going back to a system of works. Paul says, if you're going to set aside the grace of God, he says, if righteousness come by the law, then Christ indeed is dead in vain or dead without cause. What was the point of Christ coming then? Why did he die? 
Yeah, I tell people all the time, I had a lady the other day told me, she says, well, if you want to make sure you don't go to hell, you just make sure you wear the brown scapula. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, then Christ should have never gone on the cross. He should have just passed out scapulars and told everybody here, everybody get a scapula and you won't go to, you won't go to hell. Again, any time we add to the cross of Christ, add to that sufficiency, we in fact are diminishing and demeaning the work of Christ. We're frustrating the grace of yeah. God. And it's it's really very simple, and it's amazing how these two verses, verses 20 and 21, spell it out. Look at the last uh, phrase in verse 20, and gave himself for me. Right. Well, what does that speak to? That's a gift. Absolutely. Now, if somebody gives you a gift, how are you going to frustrate them? <laughs> All right, yeah. I'm going on to 21. You're going to frustrate them by trying to give them something back, trying to pay for something that's a gift. If right. you pay for something that somebody gives you, it cannot be a gift. You're denying the gift aspect of it. Absolutely. And you're going to frustrate the grace of God because this is God's unmerited gift. Well, in essence, you're rejecting it. Exactly. You're saying, no, I don't think what you did is valid. I'm going to pay for it. Uh, what an insult. Can you imagine that? Mm-hmm. For if righteousness come by the law, it can't come by the law. The Scripture tells us over and over again, if you disobey the law in any one place, according to the Catholic nomenclature, call it a venial sin. That's all it takes. And you have disobeyed the law completely. And there's no, there's no turning back. You can't retrieve your righteousness anymore. Well, and that's why he has verse 16 before verse 20 and 21. What does he say in verse 16? He says, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Mm-hmm. So there is no salvation apart from faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing. Yeah. And again, verse 21, the last part of it, then Christ is dead in vain. Right. If you think, well, wait a minute, God's going to kind of overlook that. Just because I'm trying to help things along and and do my part, God's going to look at that because I'm sincere. Wait a minute. Understand this. You or I, anyone who thinks that they can add something to Christ's finished work, if that's the case, then it's not finished. You have rejected the gift the just unfathomable gift, the wonderful gift, the gift that's beyond our comprehension that God would become a man and die for our sins. You're just, uh, you've rejected it. It's as simple as that, right, Greg? Absolutely. And certainly sincerity can never be a prerequisite for truth. No one is more sincere than Jehovah's Witnesses who go door to door, day in and day out, people turning the hose on them, dogs chasing them, throwing things at them. Why do they do that? Because they sincerely believe that they're right. But the, but the truth of the matter is they're sincerely wrong. Mm-hmm. So what determines truth? John seventeen seventeen. Jesus said, sanctify them with the truth. Thy word is truth. Search the scriptures. Turn to the word of God and see if what we're saying is true. I tell people all the time, Tom, don't believe me. I might be lying to you. So open the word of God and see if that's what the scripture says and be saved for a certainty. Mm-hmm. Well, that that brings us right to uh, chapter 3, verse 1 of Galatians. Here's Paul. Remember, he began Galatians, the first chapter of Galatians. He said, I marvel that you're so quickly turning away from the truth. Well, here we have a chiding again, and he's very serious about this. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Well, they were being foolish. And here's the foolishness. Why would someone who is set free in Christ, why would an individual now want to go return to the bondage that they were under prior to being set free? Well, that's why when Paul says foolish, he's saying, oh, senseless Galatians. We might say it, This way, how how could you be so stupid? Who hath bewitched you? Mm -hmm. Why would you turn from a finished, marvelous product that's a gift of God? Why would you turn from that and go back to a system of works that can never accomplish anything at all? Paul's basically saying that's beyond me. You're absolutely foolish. You're senseless. How could you have done that? 
Yeah. Now, we're, Greg, we're out of time in this segment, but we're going to come back to this verse uh, next week.